Madam Chair, with your permission, I would like to welcome everybody. On behalf of the International Food Policy Research Institute, the African Union Commission, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, who are jointly organizing this meeting. It is an honor and privilege for me to welcome all of you to this important conference on increasing agricultural productivity and enhancing food security in Africa, new challenges and opportunities, or in short, Ag Productivity Africa Conference. Many of you have been uh, many of you have prepared papers and speeches to deliver at this conference and travel long distances to get to Addis Ababa. Others are here to contribute to the discussion that will evolve. I hope you all find it worthwhile to spend today and the next two days to deliberate on two issues that are important for Africa's development, which are productivity and food security. Due to its importance, the conference is being held in the historic Africa Hall, which hosted the birth of the Organization of African Unity. On the wall here, you see the heads of states or heads of governments who met here in the early 60s to inaugurate the Organization of African Unity. Apart from the conference, I encourage participants to spend some time to visit historic places in beautiful Ethiopia whilst you are here. At the close of yesterday, October 31st, 2011, the world's population reached 7 billion people, and it is expected to continue to grow to 9 billion by 2050, at which time Africa's population will be 2.3 billion. In order to satisfy the world's food needs, it is estimated that production will need to grow 70 to 100 percent uh, to be able to cater for all the people. Questions of sustainability, malnutrition, food security, and environmental impact are at the forefront of international debates on how we feed, we feed a growing planet. Let me characterize um, an African farmer who I met sometime in the Sahelian region of West Africa. This farmer is called Kofi Salifu. Kofi Salifu has a wife and four children. The children are enrolled in school, which is four kilometers from their village. But they do not attend school regularly, especially during the peak period when they are asked to help with farm work. Kofi's wife, Asetu, has plans, had plans to have a farm of her own. But because of gender discrimination to access to land, she could not get her own land. As a result, she decided to work with her husband on the same farm. Kofi cultivates two hectares of land, which he inherited from his father. Neither Kofi nor his father has title to the land, except that the family has cultivated it for a very long time. There are little prospects for Kofi to obtain additional land from the village due to population pressure. Kofi should count himself lucky to have this amount of land, since many of his colleague farmers in the village cultivate about one hectare or less of land. Kofi grows sorghum, which is a major staple crop in the region, and a few other crops. Over the years, Kofi has seen his sorghum yield dwindling due to continuous cropping of the land without application of fertilizer or organic manure. In 2010, the yield for Kofi sorghum was 850 kilograms per hectare, although a research station, which is 50 kilometers away, can have about 4,000 kilograms per hectare. Once a while, the rains fail and there is drought, and the yield of coffee and the many of the farmers in the village also fall since none of them irrigates the farm. Due to the absence of effective storage structures, weevils infect coffee sorghum produce and he loses about 25% of the harvest. At harvest time, Kofi sells about a third of his farm produce and leaves the rest for seed and home consumption. He's not able to save enough produce for his house, and so he buys sorghum from the local market from time to time, especially during the lean season. He also catches fish for household consumption from a sizable river which runs beside the village. Due to the imbalanced nature and insufficient quality of their meals, 
The children often fall sick, and Madame Asetu has to stop farm work and attend to the sick. They can hardly afford orthodox medicine, and so they rely on traditional medicine for health care. The produce from Kofi's farm is purchased from, by itinerant traders who come to the village to buy and sell in urban markets. Since Kofi does not know the price in the city, he accepts any price that is offered. Kofi has attempted to sell his produce at the urban market before, but due to the deplorable state of the road, it took him long time and cost him a lot of money to transport the goods. In the end, he lost out on the sale, and so he decided to wait for the traders in the village, although he suspected he was not getting a good deal from them. Although Kofi had not, been, had not seen an extension staff for the past three years, he heard about seeds that can improve his yields and the potential for fertilizer to do the same from a farmer association he attended when he went to a funeral in a wife's village, which is 80 kilometers away. There's no farmer association in Kofi's village. If for some reason he wants to buy improved seed and fertilizer, he has to travel to the district capital, which is 60 kilometers away. He cannot obtain credit from the rural bank to buy improved seeds and fertilizer from his farm because he does not have collateral. He sometimes borrows money from lend money lenders in the village at 150% interest rate, which is about 10 times what the banks charge to finance his additional food purchases and other household expenditures. Kofi knows that farmers in the Farmers Association in his wife's village are able to obtain group loans and from the local rural bank. He has vowed to start a farmers association in his village, but he does not know how to mobilize the farmers and get the ground rules set. What is the motivation for this conference? Our motivation to organize the conference emerged from the plight of Kofi Salifu and Nasetu and many others like him um, in Africa. Although Africa has good natural resources, land and water, and there has been economic and social growth over the last 10 years, hunger and malnutrition have been increasing to the extent that about 240 million of the population is malnourished. We would like to find solutions that will improve the situations of people like Kofi and his household, especially their food security situation. It is our belief that such improvements will come from increasing the productivity of Kofi Salifu's labor and that of his land. Some questions for reflection. One, is Kofi's land large enough to provide his household a decent livelihood that is enough to eat, a good proportion to sell to enable him buy his needs? Two, why can't there be a system to register Kofi's land so that he can use it as collateral for loans and encourage him to meet, to invest in the land and adopt new technologies and innovations. Three, although it is difficult for Kofi to find ad additional land and obtain title to the land he works on, it is common knowledge that some foreigners have been given land through all kinds of arrangements. Should we encourage access to land by foreigners? How do we institute responsible governance of land and other natural resources? Four, how can we end gender imbalance and give rural women the same access as men to land, technology, financial services, education, and markets? Five, how can Kofi obtain production and marketing information to boost his production, productivity, and profitability? How can extension and advisory services be revamped to help small farmers like Kofi? Six, how can Kofi move away from traditional farming and begin to innovate with modern inputs and improve farming practices so as to increase its yields? How can the yield gap between Kofi's farm and the research station be narrowed? Seven, how can African farmers increase made maize yields from one to two tons per hectare to the potential four to six tons per hectare? Rice yields from one to two tons per hectare to the potential six to eight tons per hectare? Cassava yields from six to eight tons per hectare to the potential 20 to 30 tons per hectare. Eight, how can Kofi reduce considerably post-harvest losses? 
The Economist reported that about 40% of Africa's farm produce is lost on the way to the market. Nine, what does it take to add value to Kofi's production so that post-harvest losses can be reduced, shelf life increased, and demand increased so that Kofi can earn more from his farm enterprise? Ten, there is a river in Kofi's village, yet Kofi does not irrigate his farm and depends on rainfall, which sometimes fail him, and he loses his crop without any remedy. Why can't the river in the village provide a source of water for irrigation? 11. Why is it that just 7% of African arable land is irrigated, compared to 41% in South Asia? What does it take to increase irrigation in Africa when there are many large rivers in the continent? 12. Why is there no social protection system like insurance in place to provide a remedy for Kofi and others who lose their production due to extreme weather events? 13. Why can't public investment be increased to improve the road that connects Kofi to the urban center so that he can sell his produce for higher price and be able to buy inputs directly? 14. What, what does it take to improve rural service delivery so that Kofi can buy inputs and other supplies from his village? 15. How can Kofi get access to credit whose cost is manageable so that he can pay back from his farm enterprise? 16. How can Kofi improve the nutrition of members of his household, especially the children, to reduce the incidence of disease? 17. How can Kofi make his children attend school regularly and devote most of their time to their development instead of indulging in child labor? 18. How can Kofi's village be assisted to establish and empower grassroots organizations which will bring benefits to their members for their economic and social development? 19. What poly public policies are needed to assist Kofi to increase productivity and manage risk? 20. How can we get Kofi to move towards more commercial farming and look at farming as a business? 21. How can we bring about fundamental changes in the way agriculture is done in Africa. 22, Africa has approximately 33 million small farms. That is less than two hectares per farm. Is smallholder farming the way to go to increase agricultural production and productivity enhance food security in Africa? What do small farmers in Africa need to make them efficient? 23, how can we reverse the long-term neglect of the agricultural sector? 24, in 1979, aid to agriculture was 18% of total development assistance. By 2008, it was just 4.3%. There has been resurgence of interest in agriculture after the high food prices, but the global economic downturn has not helped in translating interest into substantial financial assistance. 25. How do we make policymakers around the world step up their critical efforts to combat hunger, malnutrition, and poverty by providing greater support for agriculture? 26. How do we get African countries to invest in agriculture? The African countries are, should put their money where their mouth is. For instance, less than 10 countries in Africa allocate about 10% of their budget to agriculture as mandated by the Maputo Declaration which is aimed at reducing hunger, poverty, and malnutrition on the continent through the CADEP. The last one is, from 2010 to 2011, budget allocation to the agriculture sector in the East African community decreased in all countries except Burundi. How do we get African countries to live up to what their heads of state signed in Maputo in 2003? But distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair, all is not gloomy. Despite the plight of Kofi Salifu and many others like him, all is not gloomy. Agricultural growth in sub-Saharan Africa rose from annual rate of 2.3% in the 1980s to 3.8% between 2000 and 2005. Over the same period, agricultural productivity rose by 50%. In many African countries, there's a rich and diverse treasure trove of innovations from farmers and farmers' groups. These results demonstrate that the challenges that face African agriculture are not insurmountable. Yes, with focus and dedication, 
Africa shall overcome. About 29 African countries and counting have signed CADEP uh, compacts and they are expected to increase spending on agriculture to at least 10% of their budgets. Yesterday, the African Food and Nutrition Security Day, which fell on October 30th, as we have been told by the chair, was commemorated under the theme, Investing in Intra-Africa -tra -tra Trade for Food and Nutrition Security. The purpose of the day is to serve as a rallying point in intensifying commitments at all levels and at all times to address the challenges of food and nutrition insecurity and malnutrition in Africa. Let us use the conference to address these challenges. What are the objectives of the conference? One is to showcase research results on the trends, determinants, constraints, and opportunities for improving agricultural productivity in Africa within the framework of the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, national and rural development strategies and investment plans. Two, identify areas for policy actions, further research and innovations towards enhancing food security and reducing rural poverty in Africa. Three, encourage appropriate communication strategies for conveying and implementing research results that improve agricultural productivity, enhance food security, and reduce rural poverty. And four is to develop partnerships for tackling food security in Africa. Yesterday, at the commemoration of the African Food and Nutrition Security Day, partnership was mentioned several times. And I think uh, that is the way that we need to go. We need to partner with each other. We need to partner with international organizations and others to surmount uh, all of these problems that I've enumerated. Last Friday, the Australian Prime Minister announced at the Commonwealth Head of State's meeting that an Australian International Food Security Center has been established for research and capacity development with seed money of 36 million cities. The exact full size for, um, for the center is to be determined early next year. But there are other partners who have been working with all of us in the past, the Gates Foundation, the USAID, AGRA, and so many other um, foundations, Irish Aid, so many of them. And then African partners, uh, FARA, um, uh, all the regional research organizations, and the national research institutes, national uh, um, extension organizations, have, we have been working in partnership, and we need to deepen this partnership as we move on. The format for the conference is going to be as follows. The conference will consist of plenary and parallel sessions. Each parallel session will have a chairperson to manage the session. The poster sessions will be presented as papers, so please visit and listen to um, the authors present these posters. I found them to be very useful, and visually you see what is going on. So don't downgrade any part of the sessions. All of them are very, very important. What are our expectations? It, for me personally, it is my expectation, and I think that of all the organizers, that this conference will not be just a talk shop. We have seen many of them in the past, and they have not been useful. We seek the full engagement of all participants, and look forward to lively and productive debates that will bring out solutions that will resolve the several challenges that African agriculture faces. We would like the solutions to contribute to the CADEP country processes that have been designed or are being designed to drive national agricultural strategies and agenda. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair, I wish all of us a fruitful international seminar. Thank you very much.